Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus in Jericho. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm all for printing the scripture lessons in, in the service folder. There's a lot of good that comes from that. But there, there is a drawback. Because unless you know the Bible by heart, or have a copy of it open in your hand, <coughs> you really have some limited context. And while the, this encounter between Jesus, Jesus and, and Zacchaeus, it, it stands fine all by itself, when you know what comes before and what comes after, I, I, think, of, I think of what before and comes after as, as the lights in a museum that shine down on, on the showcases, that draw your attention to them, and let you see all their detail in their beauty. So take, for example, what comes before Zacchaeus. A young man comes up to Jesus with a question about eternal life. And this isn't just any young man. He's, he's polite, he's wealthy, well-behaved, he's a rising star on the Jewish religious scene. He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he's like, don't worry about the commandments, Jesus. I've been keeping those since I was a boy. So Jesus says to him, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. He couldn't do it. He had a lot of wealth. All the time he had put in to acquire it, it was, it was too much to part with. This, this is where Jesus famously said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. And when all the people who were, who were part of this just gasped and said, who then can be saved? Because if this rich, respectable, wealthy man, if he, can, if he hardly has a chance, then what about the rest of us? And then what Jesus said next, that's like, that's like the light in the museum that, that shines down on to the showcase and gets us ready for what's coming up with Zacchaeus. Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then Luke introduces us to Zacchaeus just a couple paragraphs later. He's, um, he's very wealthy, like that young rich man in the earlier scene, but that's about the extent of their similarity. The religious rich guy, when he would walk down the street, imagine kids like ooing and eyeing and saying to, saying to each other, I want to be that guy when I grow up. And the parents of those kids, they see that rich guy walking down the, the street and and they ooh and they ah and they say, we want you to be like that when you grow up too. But when Zacchaeus walks down the street, how do you feel when you get a letter from the IRS that says payment due or official audit on it? And then add to that the, 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 the first century factor that tax collectors were known to have the scruples of Bernie Madoff and that the taxes that they collected, they were, they were funding your Roman oppressor, at least whatever was left of your taxes after the tax collector took their cut of it. So if, if North Korea colonized the United States, 
and imposed a 40% income tax. And then your neighbor across the street, he gets a job with collections in the Korean Revenue Service, and he knocks on your door with a bunch of soldiers behind him and says, taxes just went up to 60%, and you're struggling to, to put food on the table for your family, and then you look across the street, and, and, and your neighbor over there, he's renovating his house. That's, that's Zacchaeus. Your only consolation is that he's short. <laughs> So when Jesus comes into town, at least you can stand in front of him and block his, and block his view. Traitor. Bottom feeder. Look at the poor little rich guy climbing up in that tree to see Jesus. Serves him right. So you've got the scene in your mind. You have Jesus, friend of the people. Maybe even savior from the Romans, walking down Jericho's main drag. The crowds are all pressing against him. And then on the other side of the frame, you've got Zacchaeus, friend of the Romans, traitor to his own people. He's as far away from Jesus as, as he can get and still be in the frame. And don't feel sorry for him over there. That's exactly where he deserves to be. It makes you think, like, boy, why is he so interested in Jesus anyway? What kind of creep like him? What kind of interest could he have? Well, we could, we could, take, some, we could take some educated guesses. Why would he climb the tree to try to see Jesus? Well, maybe he was beginning to realize the futility of his own life. Maybe the weight of his guilt was really starting to press down on him, and, and he had heard of Jesus' love for, for outcasts and sinners. But at the end of the day, Luke really doesn't tell us much about why Zacchaeus climbed that tree. Only that Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. It seems like Luke is saving his ink to fill us in on another why on why Jesus would call Zacchaeus down from that tree. So you've got the image in your mind. Jesus, the crowds, Zacchaeus over here. And Jesus makes a beeline for that tree. And he calls up to the, to the outcast traitor that's perched on his branch. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And what do you think those crowds were thinking when Zacchaeus comes down the tree and welcomes Jesus into his home for, for five-star treatment? We don't have to wonder what they were thinking because they were saying it out loud. This man has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Their respect for Jesus plummeted as fast as Zacchaeus came down that, that tree. What in the world was Jesus doing? You know, if Jesus had invited himself over to that other rich man's house for dinner, the, the respectable and religious guy, that would have made sense. But Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was, that was the kind of guy that Jesus was supposed to save them from. Jesus was fraternizing with the enemy. Before we get into Zacchaeus, giving away half of his wealth and, and paying back all the people that he had defrauded. Let's, let's jump ahead past that to the end because that's where we get to the why. That's where we see why Jesus called Zacchaeus down from, from the tree. Very last line, there for emphasis, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And notice there's nothing in there about Jesus coming down like a talent scout uh, to seek out the best behaved people on earth to keep him company in heaven. Jesus didn't come because he needed people. He came because people needed him, namely the lost. The word translated lost here. Let's make sure we have this this straight. This doesn't describe someone who's just gotten a little turned around and all they need is, is a map in some direction. This is, this is lost like the sheep that wanders away from its shepherd. 
And it's going to be dinner for wolves by sunset if the shepherd doesn't find him first. It's the word that's translated perish in John 3.16. The Son of Man came to seek and to save people who were perishing. Think of a, think of a guy on a cruise ship. Have way too much to drink. He's offended pretty much everybody on, on board. He's ignored every safety regulation. And then he stumbles overboard and he's thrashing around in open water. And everyone else is, is thinking, eh, what's the loss? But Jesus, Jesus is the guy on the mast with binoculars, seeking and saving lost causes. It's the reason why Jesus came into the world for the lost. And it's what brought him to Jericho, too, which is the real zinger of the story. The scene opens with Jesus passing through town, the crowds pressing on him, the vertically challenged lowlife, furthest thing away from Jesus in the picture. But at the end of the story, Jesus reveals that this isn't a story about a sinner seeking Jesus. It's the other way around. Jesus saw Zacchaeus. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The story stands just fine on its own. But, but like the lighting at the museum on the showcase, the context gives us even more to, to draw out its beauty. I don't even have to turn the page in my Bible. Jesus is entering another city. He had gone to Jericho to find Zacchaeus. But that wasn't his last stop. Not a page later. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. And I don't know whether Zacchaeus followed him there or not. I can't say for sure. But if he did, I can tell you for sure what he saw, what Zacchaeus saw unfolding the next week. The Son of Man who came to seek and to save people that were perishing. He perished. In Jericho, he had said, Today salvation has come to this house. And then Jesus went to Jerusalem, and he made good on his word. Think about, think about how much financial ruin Zacchaeus had poured out on his own countrymen, fueled by his own greed. Think about how much righteous anger he had stirred up against himself. There's a, there's a Sunday school song that talks about Zacchaeus being a wee little man who climbed a tree. It's really cute, but let's not lose sight of the fact that, that Zacchaeus was the epitome. He was, he was the embodiment of corruption and moral depravity. The people were right when they said that Jesus had gone to be the guest of a sinner. And when Jesus went to Jerusalem from Jericho and he went up his own tree... He claimed all of that corruption and depravity as his own, and he perished. He took what Zacchaeus deserved. And because he took it, Zacchaeus no longer deserved it. We haven't talked about us at all yet. How would you fit into all this? Are you like the rich and respectable guy at the beginning? Regular at church? Been keeping God's commandments since you were a little kid? But if Jesus asked you to demonstrate your love for him by selling it all, and giving it all away, well, he'd have better luck trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip. Are you like the people? Are you like the people 
when they saw Zacchaeus, that's where the problem was. And not that you're not that you're faking it when you confess your sins, but your default self subconscious setting is to think of evil as being something outside of you. And the things that, that your biggest problems for which you need help for Jesus are everybody else's sins. Or are you like Zacchaeus? It's not as simple as that really, is it? And, and, and not just because we can all see ourselves to, to different degrees and, and all of those people. It, what also makes it hard to, to do is, is that Zacchaeus is an entirely different person at the end from at the beginning. The traitorous chief tax collector. It's like he's transformed in every way except his height. You know, Jesus doesn't even tell him to sell everything that he has and, and, give, and give to the poor. It wasn't like that other guy. doesn't even say anything to him about it. He volunteers it. And maybe the critic in us thinks, well, yeah, but, but he only gave half of what he had to the poor. Well, I think it's safe to assume that paying back all the people he defrauded fourfold would more than take care of the other half. Salvation came to his house that day, and it transformed him. The love of Jesus rubbed off on his heart, and it poured out through his actions. We are a room full of Zacchaeuses. We were lost. And not simply in the sense that we needed directions and a map. The perishing kind of loss. And the reason that's not the case anymore, it's not because we went on a hunt and found Jesus. It's because Jesus found us. It's because Jesus claimed our corruption and depravity as his own and paid its price. You know the kinds of sins that Jesus took from you to his cross. You know, you know your own better than I do. But Jesus knows yours better than you do. Because he claimed them as his own and paid the price. To use some imagery from Mike, he trampled them underfoot and hurled them into the depths of the sea. Jesus understands better than we ever will the, the magnitude of that statement we heard in Romans. While we were still <coughs> sinners, before we ever inched toward change, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus understands all that even better than we do. But we still know it. Because of his spirit putting his words on our hearts and in our ears, we know it. And it transforms us. Trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip? That's not you. And if you ever feel that it's you, if you ever, if you ever feel that, that corruption and greed and care only for yourself, gaining control, then you just imagine yourself ostracized by people, perched on a branch as far away from Jesus as you can get, and then see Jesus do it to you. Jesus make his way over to you, not because you were looking for him, but because he was looking for you. And what used to be like trying to squeeze blood out of the turn, it turns 
into the love of Jesus rubbed off on your heart, and it flows. Imagine a congregation like that, where the love of Jesus flows freely to us, where the love of Jesus flows freely from us. That's who we are. Amen.